Thank you. Hello, everyone. Allow me to warmly welcome you to today's seminar session, the ninth seminar session in the series titled Curriculum Studies in Canada. My name is Ying Ma, UBC Postdoctorate Fellow and Coordinator for this seminar series. I feel very honored to facilitate today's session. Each session will be approximately one hour with speakers allowed around 40 minutes to give their presentations, followed by a short Q&A segment. With the permission of our guest speaker, this session will be recorded and they will become available on both of our website, curriculumstudiesincanada.ca, as well as our YouTube channel. Today, we are very happy and fortunate to have Dr. Kathy Bigmore from University of Toronto to give us a talk. Dr. Bigmore will introduce herself to us first and then give us a talk titled Teaching Social Difference in Handling Conflict, Canadian Curriculum Practice in Comparative Context. Welcome, Dr. Kathy Bigmore. Thank you so much, Ying, and of course, Bill, Kpinar, and Anne Phelan, and your whole team for putting together this fantastic Curriculum Studies in Canada series. I'm quite honored to be a part of it. Uh, thanks also to all of you who are here today or listening later, and please do plan to share your thoughts on this work. From the time some of you saw this, I have changed my title to try to make a bit clearer that what I want to do today is to engage in a different way of discussing difference, focusing on the ways social and interpersonal conflicts may be handled in schools and the implications of those curricular practices for equity and inclusion across diverse diversities in and beyond Canada. You'll notice that Canadian is in quotation marks in the title because uh, there are huge amounts of transnational overlaps and influences, but also because the diversities within Canada arising from different populations, provinces, territories, geographies of concern share this indigenous and settler land we call Canada. I will address some transnational comparative dimensions, mostly in the second half of today's talk. To introduce myself just a bit more, I am like many of us a hybrid, a queer female white settler who grew up and went to school in the USA and immigrated to Canada something over 25 years ago. My PhD is in international comparative education Yet early in my academic career, I decided to first learn Canada, what I was told as a US American was friendly, familiar, foreign and near, before restarting my transnational comparative perspective from a new place, a bit further from the center in the global system. I come from the south side of Lake Ontario, Six Nations Confederacy Territory. After some long stories I'll skip, I now live on the north side of Lake Ontario in a territory that has been occupied and shared by many indigenous nations and many waves of immigrant settler communities from all over the world. Temporally, I grew up during the war in Vietnam and during a time of ferment resistance creativity in opposition to that war and more generally to colonialism, capitalism, patriarchy, and naive modernist notions of linear progress and singular truths. Rooted in my own early life experience, I developed an intense concern with violence in homes as well as in militarism and wars, injustice, and kids in trouble. Those experiences have motivated me to join the Society of Friends, the Quakers, and to look for practicality along with scholarly work. My favorite questions, as my students will tell you, are, so what? And now what? Oh, I see. Okay. Oops. 
difference is by no means the same thing as conflict. Conflict, you might say, is difference plus broken social ties, opposition, tensions, competing interests, which may be handled in any number of nonviolent and or violent, meaning harmful, ways. In this world, differences are experienced within hierarchies of status inequality and cultures of othering. Differences have too many interesting dimensions to be essentialized, yet they embody divergent perspectives. Nell Nottings in uh, something like 30 years ago in the Theory and Research and Social Education asked what it would mean if instead of appending what she called women's images firsts in formerly male dominated domains and contributions where they fit the margins of the master narrative, what if the narrative itself were pluralized to really include and encounter various women's individual and collective perspectives, cultures, and priority concerns? Now, instead, typically so-called nice, usually meaning conflict avoidant, versions of Canadian multiculturalism tend to present conflicts such as racism, colonialism, and gender oppression as if past or having been resolved here and only recognizing human rights violations over there among the others thereby denying the concerns and perspectives of differing social identity groups, refusing the listening aspect of co-creating solutions. Therefore, in this talk, I will focus on the diversity and equity dimensions and implications in various studies of implicit and explicit conflict and peace education practices involving youth in public schools. Much of my earlier work was based on this conceptual framework, which unfortunately I now view as somewhat useful, but too generic about different differences. It is limited in explanatory power because paradoxically it is abstracted from the historicized, humanized, gendered, localized specificities of various social conflicts, substance as well as process. Although differences are not always conflicts, they may be treated as such, handled in a continuum of ways between securitizing, controlling to achieve what Norwegian peace studies scholar Johan Galtung taught us to call negative peace, meaning temporary absence of direct physical violence. Between that and democratizing or positive peace, meaning durable presence, of justice alongside patterns of processes for handling conflicts in just way, transforming conflicts at their roots. These patterns of power sharing or domination have a disproportionate impact on the least powerful, racialized indigenous overlapping, but differently from economically and patriarchally or misogynistically marginalized people. I study these concerns in public schools because I believe my research has shown and others as well that they can, even though they often do not, embed building positive peace through democratization into learning opportunities in daily education in various ways I hope to illustrate today. I'll say more about these as we go. Here is my current uh, conceptual framework that, for me at least, leaves a lot more room for transnational justice sensitive, sensitive dimensions. Applying edu to education frameworks that I have learned from and with many others, a few of whom I'll mention. The first concept in this framework, based on Galton's work over 50 years ago that I just mentioned, is that conflicts and violence represented by the outer gold triangle have diverse forms, both direct, meaning intended physical harm, small scale or large scale, and indirect, socioeconomic, 
and cultural injustices. The indirect systemic issues may be seen as the roots of conflict, but in schools and the lives of young people, eradicating physical violence remains important as well as eradicating systemic indirect violences that themselves do harm as well as encouraging legitimizing physical violence, whether in war, intimate gender-based or community forms. It's only in the privileged space of the global academy that people can forget that physical violence itself is a fundamental violation of human dignity that impedes other forms of democratization toward justice. Mindful of the importance of nonviolence itself as part of justice, the continuum between direct and systemic violence or peace is complexified here in keeping with human diversities and post-structural forms of thinking. First, peacemaking dialogue, meaning participation either directly or through representation in collective or political decision-making represented at the top of the triangle is a crucial element of systemic democratic peace building. It's necessary, although diverse in form and no more sufficient by itself than the other dimensions of justice. As US political theorist Nancy Fraser explains, the processes of how decisions are made and by whom are as essential as the content of justice. Inclusion among multiple identities and equity in, in material resource dis distribution. Second, top down, down regulatory responses to conflict represented here by the intermediate green triangle include peacekeeping, but also many other forms of regulation to mitigate indirect, meaning equity and inclusion dimensions of conflict and peace. These regulatory approaches comparable to what Nancy Fraser calls affirmative rather than transformative uh, forms of justice As with peacekeeping, social and legal rep regulation may perpetuate existing hegemonies and exclusions, but also offer procedural mechanisms, whether local all the way to transnational, to handle indirect as well as direct violences, including in the socioeconomic domain, minimum wages, redistribution of land ownership and sovereignty, climate justice action, and in the cultural inclusion domain, anti-discrimination and human rights norms, control of gender or hate-based aggression, child protection, distribution of child care to mitigate the harms of certain injustice conflicts. Schools often over rely on many kinds of top-down regulation in addition to peacekeeping, meaning surveillance and punishment, such as limiting which young people can participate and how in self-governance, mandating what students need to study, minimizing spaces for dissent, yet playing a part in setting nonviolent norms through anti-discrimination and inclusion rules and negatively sanctioning abuse, violence, exclusion, and human rights violations. Third, the education needed to develop capacities to transform conflict to build just peace would differ for different kinds of differences and based in the strengths of different social, political, cultural settings. I'm still working out what all this means in practical human level terms for education and curriculum studies. Take a moment in preparation for talking this over with me to imagine how curricular foundations for handling two contemporary social conflict issues might map onto this conceptual framework. One, the distribution of health factors and met medical resources, such as risky so-called essential work, housing, damaged nat natural environments, access to primary care, 
trustworthy diagnostic te testing and vaccines to prevent illness and death from COVID-19. And the anti-Black racism embedded in policing and society being resisted by the Black Lives Matter movement. It's complicated, but what are schools for if they can't respond to such as existential concerns? All right, now I'm going to speed up a little and begin a quick chronological review of some of my previous research work with an example of democratization in handling direct conflicts. In peer mediation, student protagonists learn to facilitate sometimes just a cadre of mediators, sometimes whole classes or whole grades, and to participate, that is as participants, as clients in constructive dialogue. And so they learn by practicing modeling sanctions and norms to some degree. So a very long time ago already, I did a large research evaluation study in 1999-2000, in which we chose 30 schools for the project because these schools had not yet chosen to hold trainings from the WAVE organization in their school board. WAVE was in style at the time and was, stands for Winning Against Violent Environments. Thus, they were a difficult set, not enthusiastic early volunteers. The uh, small average effect size is statistically significant at uh, P minus 0 0.01, which is impressive in a way because it reflects the entire grade three, four, and five populations, not only those directly involved in peer disputes and mediation. These res results don't reflect mere maturation effects. The unit of analysis was the school measured by grade, comparing grade three students to grade three students 12 months later and so forth. Thus, the results reflect school level improvements in the average student's capacity and willingness to nonviolently handle interpersonal conflicts and to engage in school. So looking at this from a different kind of difference perspective using my current framework, I wanna highlight that it became very clear with this very robust sample that when schools not only selected but supported cadres of diverse student mediators as peer facilitators and school staff advisors who respected and advocated for those diverse students, then those school programs were extremely successful in reducing levels of direct and indirect violence in the school as perceived not only by the average, but also by reducing the variance between the children who reported they felt the least safe and the ones who felt the most safe because of course, those who felt the least safe were the ones who were being harassed or bullied or excluded and so forth. It's not hard to understand. As you can see, diverse uh, young people can mediate best in their own languages and forms of expression. For instance, I saw peer mediators work very well using sign language for the deaf. Newcomer immigrants using home languages and sometimes speaking more than one language to help their peers to understand each other well. I saw children as young as six years old do a wonderful job facilitating peer mediation, peacemaking, problem solving, not only among their peers, but among older peers. And very often they volunteered to help their parents. And we found out when their parents called up the school to say, what's happened? And often they did remarkably well. Peer mediation does not require good reading skills. In fact, it's an excellent way for children and youth to practice communication, analysis, problem solving skills. On average, the schools that limited peer mediation implementation or participation in order to force certain students, especially those not doing well or those in the high stakes testing year, 
to spend more time on academic work, test preparation, actually did less well on a major standardized achievement test than the comparable schools controlling for social class and mobility and so forth that did fully implement and sustain peer mediation programming with diverse mediators. I think this is for two reasons based on the qualitative work because peer mediation facilitates practice of academically relevant skills and because peer mediation helps to resolve the problems that otherwise would distract students and cause them to miss school. Jumping ahead several years, a five-year research project, my first one in my effort to get to know Canada after I immigrated here, well, maybe my second, uh, called Safe and Inclusive Schools, examined qualitatively the policy environments and programming actually enacted by educators in Canadian urban public school districts that were particularly stressed by demographic change, standardized curriculum and assessment, and resource scarcity to highlight the dilemmas and possibilities educators faced in creating and implementing policies and programming for safe and inclusive schools. All the sites were economically stressed big city boards with differently ethnically racially diverse students. The purpose of samples of interviewees in each board were both centrally assigned and school-based educators who were involved with any aspect along that initial continuum that I showed you, peacemaking, peace building, or more like peacekeeping, safe schools related initiatives, including equity and shared governance, democratic peace building initiatives. In one school board, we also dove deeper and interviewed a larger purpose of sample of adults uh, involved with peacemaking, peace building, and safe schools related activities in five focus schools in comparable population areas with comparable what they call learning opportunities indicator, which is social economic status, mobility, and language, and some other variables, and contrasting violence profiles. So a high school of equivalent status with a lot of violence and less violence elementary schools with different approaches as well. One of the things that I found out in this study and learned and wrote about with my colleague Angela McDonald was to try to understand the so-called leadership roles that were played by various students at these various schools and school boards. And you see the old framework there just beginning to maybe morph into some aspects of the newer framework. Lots of similarities between boards and regions, actually a surprising number considering official policy differences. Opportunities for active student peacemaking and peace building roles in leadership were not available at all schools, even though the whole approach was purpose of sampling to identify such activities where they did exist. Many of the roles that interviewees called mediation when they were described were primarily peacekeeping, meaning monitoring and control. And unfortunately, most often high status, successful and compliant students were success selected for leadership cadres. Although there was a lot more diversity in some schools than in others. That is, even when schools started out with diverse students in their mediation training, if the lower status students who were more uh, creative and resistant and maybe mouthy and rubbed teachers, some teachers the wrong way, those people sometimes got excluded from the opportunity to participate in mediation unless they had a strong advocate who understood what they needed to do and a strong democratic process in the mediation team and its autonomous decision making as well. Gender expression also operated quite differently 
among these different spaces and forms for student activity. You can see some of the range here and I'm not going to read them to you, but I'll just take a breath and let you have a look so that you can ask questions and raise your comments later. So mediation, of course, is only one way of doing facilitated communicative problem solving, but it was an important way in that period of time. One of my later publications actually argued that when many peer mediation programs were replaced by so-called anti-bullying programs, the student leadership teams became more narrow, meaning more reflective of elites, and they, the programs didn't grow. They weren't trusted by a sufficient proportion of the student population. And so there were a number of ways in which it looked as if anti-bullying projects were actually exacerbating the factors that underlie bullying, meaning status inequality, social exclusion, uh, lack of opportunities to shine and to have a voice and so forth. There were a lot of different things that passed as so-called leadership courses, some of which looked quite like you've seen before in places you've been to school, student councils, student participation in school governance. But one of the most interesting things I thought was that I'll actually mention in relation to this next slide, was that several student organizations that began as affinity groups for instance, Muslim student associations that began as Friday prayer groups, or what were then called gay straight alliances, except in the schools that censored that and made them call them things like the be yourself group. In some school contexts, particularly the more nonviolent school contexts, those became education and advocacy groups that is others in the broad formal and informal governance and political process of the schools, ask the Muslim students to come and have a discussion with their class. For instance, given the timing of this research after the attack on the US World Trade Center in 2001. Uh, and similarly with questions of homophobia and transphobia and so forth. However, the only institutional activities, according to the historical perspective in the interviews, that were really sustained over time and accessible to most students were discipline in the relatively narrow sense and classroom curriculum. These core practices seemed the most difficult to change although a few interviewees did describe some changes toward peace building, but the, those co-curricular spaces, so I'm talking about kids who needed to work for a living or take care of siblings or girls whose mobility was constrained uh, for misogynistic or cultural reasons, et cetera. The co-curricular spaces were accessible to fewer students, vulnerable to policy shifts and budget cuts, and dependent on a few individual adults. Sometimes those were relatively autonomous and open to innovation. Maika Lopez Cardoso and her international team looking at youth agency and peace building in an international comparative basis has found precisely the same thing that on one hand, the most compelling spaces for young people's agency in contributing to building democratic peace tended to be non-formal or co-curricular or both, but the vast number of people that were affected by even small changes in formal curriculum in formal schools is really important to remember. The others, the funding would disappear and they were vanishingly small in the scheme of things. So to be sustained, peacemaking and peace building programming had to be anchored, surprise, surprise, by the allocation of regular work responsibilities 
and professional development for existing school and district staff. Changing the page again, it became very clear by the end of this study that I needed to go more directly to look at where peacemaking and peace building initiatives might fit in regular schools. These days, instead of peer mediation, the uh, perhaps most favored uh, peacemaking strategy is often called restorative justice. And although it can be implemented very narrowly in schools at times, the theorists and academics and researchers working in this area often talk about broadening restorative justice practices to include all kinds of proactive dialogue, inclusion, mutual engagement, equity work, and so forth in order to get people uh, equipped to share governance, to be part of solving problems together. But they still very often have allowed themselves to be left into the governance arena, the discipline arena, after issues, episodes have arisen. Not always, but in practice very often. Whereas meanwhile, we have this thing we call curriculum, which for 40 years now, at least we have understood is not just the content that's been planned by the powers that be, but rather the experience of explicit as well as implicit classroom, classroom learning interactions of all kinds, content and process. If peace building is moved and in its various dimensions is moved into the classroom curriculum, meaning the enacted and experienced curriculum arena, then the energies can be spent on rebuilding relationships, building or rebuilding skills, understandings, uh, equity, and so forth in relation to particular kinds of justice problems throughout the conflict cycle, meaning before episodes arise, as well as after episodes arise, as well as in the long-term follow-up. So here's what happened when I tried to study that. I'll introduce you only very briefly to a, a very few of the teachers that I was able to get to know in a project called Peace Building Dialogue. Uh, this is another Canada-based project looking at comparative case studies of pedagogies that involved what I called conflict dialogue, not necessarily violence, but any kind of disagreement, competition, justice issue, uh, competing values and needs and so forth in various ways. I sampled these teachers by participating actively in three teacher professional development initiatives, each of which handled questions of conflict and peace building in different ways using dialogue. One was a scripted, rather prescriptive, restorative conferencing approach used primarily to facilitate dialogue between so-called offenders and victims and affected communities to repair relationships after incidents of harm. Another was also a restorative project, but a much more open-ended, flexible peacemaking circle approach focused on uh, both post-incident and proactive pedagogies in which, as we learned from elders in North America, a talking piece was circulated in order, at least part of the time, to give every participant an opportunity to hold the floor and to speak or to pass as they wished. And last but not least, Third, a human rights citizenship education program, much more content heavy based on discussion and reflection regarding genocide history and its relevance to contemporary instances of social exclusion. So we recruited three to five teachers 
associated with each of these professional development uh, activities. These are all pseudonyms, of course. Uh, and we'll see whether we actually have time to do all four. One uh, case that we found particularly interesting was in a non-university stream, upper secondary science class taught by um, Ms. Parisi, a pseudonym. She opened a, a talking circle involving uh, students having already practiced passing a talking piece. And after the unit that the students had studied on infection, infectious diseases, she asked the students this question. They had been prepared the weekend before to think about it. Should HIV infected individuals have the right to the same publicly funded medical insurance as others who don't have HIV? Her second question referred to a scenario the class had read in which Albert knew he, had knew he carried HIV and yet had unprotected sex with Bridget. Both now had AIDS. She asked the students, do you think that people who don't take the necessary precautions and are out there doing risky behaviors that expose them to more infectious agents should be covered still under the same type of health care? Does that remind you of any public events in the world today? Often, the this group passed a talking piece, meaning every student spoke. Some had the right to pass, but generally they didn't. Other segments were open where the talking piece was put down in the middle and there was a rapid back and forth dialogue in which some voices dominated, but the energy rose in many ways. Students expressed understanding just based on listening to them speak of applying key concepts in science seemed to be enhanced by lessons applying that knowledge to a contemporary public policy conflict, expressing and responding to peer disagreements. And a final dialogue question that day turned students' attention to problem solving, as often happens in restorative processes, building on students' arguments for the needs to spread awareness, asking, what can we do about this? We have a problem, and so forth. Skipping ahead for now, in an upper secondary grade 10 history class, there was a unit about the Nazi Holocaust. And there were lots of interesting things, all of which of course involved conflict and injustice that were shared and discussed and engaged with, with very multimodal uh, pedagogies. And then near the end of the unit, Ms. Georgialis showed a short YouTube video, maybe you saw it at the time, in which an elderly Holocaust survivor and his grandchildren went in person to the Auschwitz death camp, which is now a museum, and danced to the song, I Will Survive. Ms. Georgialis opened, showed that video to the class and opened a discussion. Was this an appropriate memorial? She told the class that she wasn't even sure of her own views on this. It was okay that people disagreed. She asked a whole series of open questions to encourage many students to express multiple divergent viewpoints and to explain when they changed their minds, which they did. Free flowing discussion without a talking piece was passionate, but respectful. Here you see students not just studying examples of conflict in history, but practicing, expressing their own perspectives and commitments to human rights citizenship in the context of human rights violation, both through the arts, they created their own memorials and in this dialogue. Now, lest you think we can't do this with much, much younger children, the research showed very similar principles for building inclusive, res respectful relationships and teaching conflict resolution concepts and skills being implemented in early primary grades. And here's one example where students role played an ant 
and a child who wanted to step on that ant and then came back to a circle and used a talking piece quite quickly, the attention spans not that long, and asked, if you were the child in this situation, what would you do and why? And the children disagreed. And yes, that disagreement fell to some degree along gender lines. All the girls and some of the boys felt that it was not a good idea to step on the ant. And some of the boys felt very strongly that it would be quite fun to step on the end. One last example, a class meeting in a class that used restorative peacemaking circles regularly in which some a conflict had occurred at recess. The teacher had implemented many lessons in examining and discussing the conflicts in children's picture book literature but also guided students to apply the same skills and process to resolve real conflicts in their own experience. In this instance, an ongoing conflict between the girls and the boys about the use of a favorite area in the playground during recess. This vignette begins to show how different forms of dialogue can facilitate inclusion and equity among perspectives and among people across social differences, even confronting inequity challenges. And again, the children moved in and out of active things like skits, role-playing, and sitting down together to talk. Well, much as I would love to talk your ear off about any of these projects, time is flying. I'm gonna mostly skip this piece for now, but just to say that in this project, uh, we went on, my research team and I, to think about the shapes of the classroom talk that had gone on and their divergent implications for diverse student populations. The person at the apex of the triangle on the top is the teacher. The students are all facing the teacher. The most confident students speak up or raise their hands and are recognized. And even if they do respond to peers, it always goes through the teacher and the teacher responds. You've seen that. Then there were some hybrid triangle and circle kinds of conferencing processes in which students at least faced one another, but still the most confident talkers were the ones that volunteered comments to the teacher or to their peers. And you've already heard a bit about a talking circle process in which students can face one another. A talking piece circulates to invite every teacher and student to speak or to pass. Uh, this means that any of these can take place either in a fishbowl, a small group with the others watching that you might trade later, or in the whole class if the class isn't too gigantic as they seem to be these days. But you can see how there is space for some peace building dialogue attentive to equity and to inclusion, meaning to status and to identity in ordinary classrooms, not typical classrooms, but some ordinary classrooms. My colleague, Christina Parker and I uh, went on to do another study that Christina Parker has led called Constructive Conflict Dialogue. It became very clear from the previous project that a weak link was teacher professional development. Now I realize one can overdo that and that it can become part of a blame the sort of blame the teacher approach. You know, the reason they're not having more conflict dialogue, more peace building, more discussion of meaningful conflictual issues is because of the teacher. Well, it's also because of the standardized tests, the class sizes, the bells ringing every X number of minutes and a lot of other factors, the discipline and punishment rules in the school and so forth. But still on the idea that teachers themselves would like more help, even the teachers who expressed strong commitment to inclusive conflict dialogue still told us that they felt underprepared for it. 
in general or in relation to particular conflicts that in their communities were considered sensitive. So Christina Parker's study focused on how training teachers in restorative justice practices could help teachers facilitation of constructive conflict dialogue using circles and other processes. Again, locating dialogue as a necessary component of peace building, particularly in very sensitive and in post-violence or currently violent contexts as part of educating for and about peace, democracy, and social justice. Part of the message I want to communicate today is that the handling of conflict and aggression, especially through talk, needs to be foregrounded in social justice education and social justice practices in educational settings, much better theorized, much better incorporated in professional learning, systematically studied as conflict using some of what we have learned transnationally about the relationship of education to conflict to the agency of young learners. So far, Christina Parker's findings reinforce some prior findings. That is that again, even among teachers who self-selected to participate in a project about learning to facilitate conflictual dialogue, sensitive and hot topics were often avoided. Although there were also the opposite problem, equally problematic, in which teachers launched into sensitive and hot topics, for instance, existing bullying dynamics in the group without the preparation of skills and relationships that could make that a safe enough space for children to participate. In debriefing circle dialogue processes, some students, including those in particular, those who usually otherwise tended to dominate discussions, didn't much like having to wait their turn to speak as the talking piece circulated. Others were fine with it. In three of these four classrooms, male students consistently dominated most circles and most open discussions of conflictual issues. However, once again, we had a classroom and a teacher, teacher number four here, who where female students did speak up actively and racialized students as well. And so there was more potential. Thinking about the broader conceptual framework that I presented to you. Those outside versus inside what Lisa Delpit among others calls the culture of power have unequal opportunities to learn to communicate persuasively and especially to be heard across difference. Patterns of gendered cultural inequity influence the authoritativeness or perceived authoritativeness, as Roger Simon explained, of diverse students' voices in classroom dialogue. That is, peers, teachers, and students themselves perceived some students' ideas as more convincing and valuable than others. Authoritative speech patterns, such as declarative statements, assertive tones of voice, may be seen as masculine and more open-ended. Qualified statement, sorry, may be seen as masculine, while more open-ended qualified statements, you might say open-minded, may be seen as relatively feminine, as Tula Gordon and her colleagues found in Finland. Especially in conflictual conversations, such gendered cultural expectations create differential pressures on diverse students speaking and on their attentiveness or inattentiveness to others' speech. Further, the conflicts may be addressed in ways that seek to bridge the differences that become visible or to encourage hostility, whether in supposed, supposedly peaceful, racialized colonial contexts, such as North America, as studied by uh, Schultz, Buck, and, and Nias, among others, or in divided societies, so-called post-armed conflict societies, as Beckerman, Zembelast, and McGlynn 
from Israel, Palestine, Cyprus, and Northern Ireland found out some years ago. And last but not least, I finally get to the comparative international dimension that I promised in this uh, presentation. And again, I'll be a bit brief and then you can decide where to engage me in conversation. My current research has been able to go explicitly international comparative at last, to begin investigating and meeting those challenges in diverse contexts. This journey began with Canadian and Mexican case studies funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. And my research team and I have had the marvelous opportunity to broaden our base of comparison through collaboration with various brilliant doctoral students on my research team, each leading a comparable or partially comparable study in their own countries of origin. Doctor already finished his doctorate, Ahmed Salahin Kaderi in Bangladesh, Angel Aguera Sua in Greater Bogota, Colombia. And now we're beginning to, I don't report on these data until the student finishes their doctorate, but this is coming along. Najmi Kishani Farahani is just finishing her doctorate in Greater Tehran, Iran. And in particular, my original collaborator in this project, who has done a lot of this thinking alongside me, is Dr. Patricia Carvajal in Mexico. All of the sites are public schools serving diverse student communities experiencing unusually high levels of violence, except Najmet Kashani's uh, thesis inquiry in Iran included a wonderful pair of two affluent and two poor and working class and two male and two female schools. And there are various other somewhat related studies by other research team members in including Diego Nieto Sachika in other uh, Colombian cities, one of which was surrounded by the civil war zone, Dr. Yona Ahmad in teacher professional development projects among Egyptian and Muslim Canadian teachers. So here's the research question, how may schooling in these settings address and or ignore young people's own lived experiences of violence, peace, and citizenship. So in each country or jurisdiction, we had uh, three or four schools. And within each school, we had three or four focus groups of students between ages of 10 to 15 in smaller age cohorts a series of ongoing focus group workshops with teachers that worked with that same population of students before and after the student focus groups, and lots of document analysis around official curriculum mandates, conflict democracy, issues in local contexts, and so forth. We paid attention to emotional responses as well as cognitive responses and to diversity within the groups. Just to give you a sense of what this was like, there were different image prompts for the different students' workshops in each situation, always vetted by their teachers and people locally, but they all included direct uh, violence, including gender-based violence, police violence, economic inequity, so obviously we showed the poor fellow with snow on his back, homeless to Canadian students and the other one of the woman carrying terrible burdens for a few pennies in Mexico, for instance, uh, and being paid very little for it. Not all the students really recognized the world map enough to interpret the cartoon at the bottom but working together, they got pretty close. And then other land and resource conflicts like what they call land grabbing associated with the civil war and displacement in Colombia and uh, various kinds of environmental pollution. And in each of these instances, we asked the children to work like reporters to choose 
two images, one at a time, or really two issues inspired by the images. We didn't care if it was the same as what the cartoonist or photographer intended. And then to talk about who, why, when, where, right? So what's going on? Who are the parties? Who's affected? Who might be able to do anything about this problem? That kind of thing, to get an understanding of, of how they understood these conflicts. And at the end, we ask each group of students for their advice to teachers anonymously. What do they wish teachers would be teaching them and or how? This is just a little bit about these three contexts. I would be happy to spend more time than I have today. But for now, let's say that uh, the so-called Global Peace Index places these three jurisdictions in very different places and the content of the conflicts are quite different in relation to the government, in relation to ethnocultural diversity and so forth. Gender-based violence was a problem in all of these contexts. Poverty was a problem in all of these contexts, even the Canadian contexts. Teachers' curriculum in use approached questions of social diversity, inclusion, and equity, such as poverty, gender, relations between settler and indigenous communities, highlighting the uneasy intersections between teaching values and addressing social, structural, and political dimensions of conflict. In Ontario, Canada, Teachers taught multicultural awareness and what they called character, individual character, the, the idea that individuals could make a difference and narrated a peaceful nation of immigrants with oppression in the past tense. In Bangladesh, participating teachers taught moral precepts and exemplary narratives, most of them from Islam. For instance, it is immoral to treat women disrespectfully and moral to materially aid the poor if one is able. And also a national enemy narrative in relation to Pakistan and to people that were understood as allies of Pakistan within Bangladesh, who were represented in election violence during every campaign. In Mexico, the teachers taught abstract values linked to interpersonal behavior, such as respect, honesty, solidarity, and a national narrative of mestizaje, meaning seamlessly blended indigenous and European origins, the story of the one uh, people being created through the synthesis of European and indigenous origins. Within each of these contexts, a few curriculum excerpts went beyond what Fraser calls affirmative or thinly democratic representations of multiculturalism to encompass potentially transformative or thickly democratic participatory and or equality dimensions of social diversity and justice. Comparing these curriculum choices for teaching compliant tolerance and accommodation that would not rock the boat or for teaching social justice, democratic justice foundations for sustainable positive peace makes visible in these non-war contexts an alternative comprehensive or narrow approaches to value-laden education for social conflict education that might contribute to positive peace. So again, I'd like to talk about a lot of each, but for now, let me just pull out the issue of gender. The, of the three sites I'm discussing here, commonly across this, the four schools in the Mexican case, gender and gender-related inequity, such as differential, differential salary, salary and hiring and discrimination uh, and, um, aggression were covered to some degree in all of the teachers curricu Im implemented curriculum, particularly in the grade five, six, so ages 10, 11, 12, less so 
in grades seven and eight, meaning lower secondary. Uh, for now, I'd better go on so that I can get time to talk with you. Uh, in Bangladesh, the, there was some emphasis on gender-based violence and inequity. Uh, I mentioned already that it's, uh, the teachers said very clearly that it is against Muslim precepts to discriminate against women or to be aggressive, for example, harassing women. But much of this was taught as individual self-control, self-regulation, and a particularly pinned on the girls and women to not provoke. In fact, in one elementary classroom, uh, there was some talk about that. So you might say the social justice issue was raised or the difference issue was raised, but somehow not really as a conflict in which there would be legitimately different points of view. Opposing views were marginalized as not being proper Bangladeshi or Muslim. And last but not least, Ontario was a very interesting case. In those three schools, gender inequity was mentioned because we asked about it in the teacher focus group, private conversations more than once, but gender inequity was rarely, if ever, mentioned in the actual enacted curriculum according to students' narratives or according to teachers' narratives. And yet, when the students described the violence they had experienced, generic and homophobic bullying and gender-based bullying was rampant. So rampant that in one case, we were strangers. We had the, the uh, confidence of some of the staff that enabled us to go through the consent process and be invited into these schools. But the children did not know us in advance. They agreed to participate in these workshops and were brought in two separate focus groups to tears, talking about the violence they were experiencing in school. And yet this never came up in class. So in these curricular narratives, both official curriculum and enacted or experienced curriculum, the emphasis was on negative peace, not meaning bad if you don't have even negative peace, being the absence of violence is a good thing, but it doesn't help people understand what to do about conflicts, what they have a right to, how to understand perspectives of others and so forth. Very much in individual terms, very much with nation states at various levels as protectors of rights rather than violated violators of students' rights. And this contracted, contrasted directly with students' lived experiences in all three contexts or all several schools in this study. There were some social diversities absorbed in each national narrative, uh, often with this perspective of political conflicts have, having been relegated to the past, gendered aspects of those conflicts and violence tended to be marginalized or ignored. And current kind of capital P political intergroup conflicts tended to be silenced whether it was about Francophone, Anglophone relationships or relationships between Quebec and the rest of Canada, indigenous rebellions and drug gang wars in Mexico, political polarization in Bangladesh, particularly around elections and so forth. With what has become unfortunately my usual but that we're trying to understand where the small ingredients of peace building might be building blocks that could be expanded upon, learned from, and so forth, and where they might be blocking peace building development in the more comprehensive democratic sense. So to finish up revisiting this dimension to this uh, diagram, to invite your critique and elaboration. 
and you can see what's there. The three key dimensions out of Mark Howard Ross, Nancy Fraser, uh, Johann Galtung of direct conflicts and political participation to handle them, small or large scale, cultural inclusion across identities, socioeconomic equity, and the levels all the way from violence in the outside to regulation, which supports hierarchy, but deals with some of the symptoms to little moments moving toward systemic democratic peace building. So in the context, in the breadth, breadth of viewpoints that were presented and allowed in conflictual curricular content and in various pedagogical task structures, for example, uh, small group work organized with equity principles to uh, undercut some of the usual status differences and find a way for everyone to contribute. And of course, relationship building and skill building. Those are some of the spaces for conflict and peace building in relation to different kinds of differences. And here are a few tentative conclusions to encourage you to participate now in some conflict talk about curriculum and social difference in and beyond Canada. That we're not gonna get education for building just peace unless we have conflict education. And that's particularly important for justice education. That surfacing hidden systemic and direct conflicts in and across various axes of difference can offer opportunities for multidimensional engagement and learning, whereas avoiding those conflicts, dealing with difference as if there were no conflict, denies and disrespects those differences and blocks learning opportunities. And for each of these dimensions, transnational, political, cultural, and social structural dimensions inevitably shape both the conflicts themselves and the options for learning about them and for handling them. And I've already mentioned my guarded optimism about public schools as imperfect but safer spaces that can contribute to building equitable peace for democracy. And last, what I learned from Toronto scholar Ursula Franklin, that peace is indivisible. That if some people are still abused and marginalized, et cetera, and don't have peace, none of us will anyway, just like the coronavirus. Thank you so much for listening for so long. This is too small, but just send me a note if you would like to uh, a copy of the slides or what have you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bigmore, for your very insightful uh, talk, especially the researches and projects you share with us. Very inspiring. Thank you so much. And I know uh, Dr. Bigmore is very much looking forward to having a discussion. So now we are open for questions. And comments and criticisms, please. <laughs> comments, yeah. So you can just unmute yourself and uh, share what you think or your questions. Well, just one of my questions, that many, many questions. Uh, this is a really quite, uh, really extremely thought provoking and a fascinating presentation. Thank you so much, Kathy. Uh, one of my questions is someone who has been involved somewhat in the education system, but comes with a legal background, how much curriculum has to be set aside or moved around in order to enable um, an increase presence of the kind of curriculum that I think probably most of us agree needs to be in place. 
Oh, thanks, Ever, for the support and for that's a really great place to start. I've written about that particularly, and it was part of the focus group discussions with all of the teachers and all of the sites in this last project as well. In my view, in a nutshell, the official curriculum has plenty of space. It reflects desires of some odd mix of curriculum writers, not practice, but, and, and it's by no means perfect, but there were opportunities. What we did was do an analysis of what we called conflict learning ingredients, opportunities to learn in those dimensions, direct participation, dialogue, conflict management, peacemaking as a process or just as parts, relationship rebuilding, inclusion, overcoming, outgrouping, so inclusion, uh, and various questions of equity in the material sense. And there were lots of opportunities. It's a question of how teachers have time and feel able to embark on the reason those things are sitting there in their curriculum guidelines. So when you, as you found out in your own programs in Peace Builders, Eva, when young people are given a process to talk about things, they'll bring it up. They know about many conflicts and they can tell you what's already been covered to some degree, usually too briefly in their classrooms. The space is there, but it's a really hard space to use as each of these studies has shown. So, so I guess my related question is, um, it's not just the space in the curriculum, but it's the teacher's comfort level in getting into the space and getting into these conversations with the students about a lot of subjects which they may personally feel quite uncomfortable in addressing. And so the teacher education component of this is, is the other related uh, question. Yes, but even for instance, in Christina Parker's study in which teachers were selected because they wanted this and then they had this marvelous opportunity for coaching inside their own classroom with their own students, even then it was difficult. We can't just individualize this. Why are teachers uncomfortable? They're uncomfortable because the bell's gonna ring in 12 minutes. They're uncomfortable because they have a huge class size. They're uncomfortable because they have standardized testing and other accountability measures that are constraining them. So now I've given you in a way the paradoxical opposite answer about curriculum. Curriculum in the big sense of the policy environments for teaching and learning, I do think comfort and practice, especially if we would spend our time not talking about things to add, which is very overwhelming to teachers, but instead talking about places to have conversations in relation to what teachers and students are already supposed to be doing. That's where the spaces are. When the teachers in Mexico, in one of the lower secondary schools uh, in their fifth focus group meeting, uh, I had a family emergency and wasn't there, but Patricia Carvajal, who, as I said, was very important to this project all along and another member of my team were there and they were talking about what they had understood from the first four workshops and from the concerns and so forth. And they had a, a process we had developed to kind of try to link what they needed to teach with some of these opportunities to not only converse with, but frankly, listen to students. And all of a sudden, one of the teachers in the group spoke up to her colleagues and said, now I know what those inspectors were telling us to do. Because of course, even the upper echelons are saying critical thinking, student-based instruction, la la la. And conflict dialogue is one of the ways to do that. And then there was a, a little opening for the next project that I think we need to implement. 
Other comments and questions, please. Hello, I have a comment for, on your model. If you can put the slide of your, the triangle model. Okay, let me try. I got all these things. There we go. Oops, did that work? Yeah, perfect, perfect. I just wonder you refer, re, you reference a lot of time Nancy Fraser work. Yes. And I was wonder why did you put on the bottom left of the triangle inclusion instead of redistribution and you to, to uh, take the ball that you just throw about. It's not just about adding things to the curriculum, but it's about to put some kind of weight to those things, to place them in relationship to each other. So what I found in my research is that teachers are often very uh, prone to wanting to include a lot of things without necessarily thinking about the redistributive aspects of it. So concretely, it means that you cannot include everyone once, once you start thinking about, well, but I'm, how I'm gonna redistribute the space. Not everyone can talk, not, you know, there's not an unlimited, for, for instance, time to talk in a, in a circle uh, of peace. I, I was just wondering why, you know, this inclusion versus redistribution um, issue uh, is uh, considered in your model. Thanks, Thank Raphael. Uh, it makes me smile because my team and I have had umpteen conversations about this. And uh, Patricia Carvajal, one of the initial members of the team who has co-created a lot of this thinking with me, how many walks did we have trying to get together? What does that look like, equity versus inclusion? in school. So this model does include all three of Nancy Fraser's priorities. The bottom right is equity in specifically in that sense. We didn't use the term redistribution because it wasn't a meaningful term to school people by and large. We looked for words that made sense. And also I think it has to do with the issue of applying to education. But on average, I absolutely agree with you. In fact, as you know, Nancy Fraser's argument is precisely that many justice workers, activists, tend to overemphasize inclusion, that is identity politics, and underemphasize material conditions. And one can imagine why, just looking at the priorities and status of many of us with all good intentions. But there are lots of opportunities to talk about material equity issues as well. I do recommend Patricia Carvajal's PhD thesis, which is available online on T-Space, and she has some shorter articles as well, because she applied this specifically to classroom pedagogy. She used of three teacher case studies. She spent a lot of time inside those classrooms. Two of them were the same as two of the teachers. Uh, in, in uh, our, the Peace Building Dialogue Citizenship, sorry, Peace Building Citizenship Project. Um, and so Patricia has really thought about that at this more micro level of schooling or in-person level of schooling. So what's status or redistribution? On a global scale, looking at transnational research, it includes access to school at all, access to quality school, access to well-trained teachers, and on and on and on, you could go from there. But it, once you're already inside a classroom with a given set of students uh, and a given teacher, then access has to do with status among students. Do people have access to the floor, that is to talking and working because they learn through that. Do they have access to thinking of themselves and being thought of as smart people? Do they ever get a good mark? Do they ever get a learning activity that shows what they're good at and so forth? And yes, that overlaps with inclusion, but inclusion is more about identity in the intangible sense and both are necessary. I also agree with you that in the little bit of, of evidence from the findings that I shared, this is a real problem. There was lots more, not only individualistic, 
but inclusion focused lessons, right? Human rights lessons of one kind or another or gender equity or about this group or that group or global education if they were in Canada, the global position of the other countries being quite different. And it wasn't until the teacher focus groups when we asked, for instance, about the uh, fairly significant number of lessons about the Mexican Revolution that the teachers started naming the redistrib redistributive aspects, right? Land reform, gender, po political power, political corruption. And, and those are essential too, because the students knew what they were, for sure. In the focus groups, they chose distribution issues very often as major concerns. Poverty, just for instance. Yeah, thank you. I, I, it it reminds me, I'm always thinking about this question of, I think the word inclusion give the impression that it's unlimited. And it doesn't really give you a sense of the form in which is it, in, it is included. And it's not give you a sense of the includer, who's including. It's just like something that pours on and on and on. So yeah, thank you for your insights. Thanks. And I wouldn't mind having some more input on that because it's been, we've used other words, cultural pluralism, things like that. And none of them is ideal, but what would work for you? What would work for the teachers you work with and so forth? So thank you. Thank you so much again, Dr. Bigmore. And uh, I think in the interest of time, I think I need to close today's session. And uh, I, I want to thank Dr. Bigmore and also the discussions we have just had is very inspiring and very insightful. And I also want to thank Dr. William Piner and Dr. Anne Villan, who host the uh, Curriculum Studies in Canada seminar sessions and those who make this possible. Uh, our next seminar session is scheduled on February 26, 2021. We look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ying. Thanks, everybody, so much Thanks. for coming. Thanks, Kathy. <laughs> and your comments. Thanks, Joanne. Rafael, Eva, good to see you. Yeah. Miriam, hey. Good to see you people. <laughs>